Hello everybody and welcome this week to Talking Flutes Extra with me, Jean-Paul Wright. As always, a big shout out to our sponsors, TJ Flutes, who have been with us since we began this podcast channel six years ago. You can show them some flute love by visiting them on their socials, TJ Flutes on Instagram, Trevor James Flutes on Facebook and also on the web, tjflutes.com. He once said, The piccolo rarely appears as a solo instrument. There are only a few concerts for them, but as an orchestral musician, you need the ability to express yourself as a soloist within a short period of time, and at the same time to adapt to the overall sound of the orchestra. Most of the time, the sound of the piccolo has to mix with other instruments. For example, as in Mahler's first symphony, with the oboe. These are some of the greatest challenges for the piccolo player. This week, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome the wonderful Igor Igorkin, principal piccolo player of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. I began this podcast by asking him about something I had read and that it was his parents he had to thank for the fact that he became a flute player, but not because they wanted him necessarily to play the flute, but for another reason. I think everyone understands uh, that parents are actually investing their huge amount of time in the in their kid, and I think with, in my case, it, no difference. I got lucky that they had chance to invest a, a lot of time time in me, and I think it's because of one small tiny funny incident that my teacher he said, "Well, you know that actually I'm I'm really thankful. My teacher is again." Wonderful, wonderful, amazing teacher. I got luck to study from him many years through entire career. I learned from him, Vladimir Shakov. And at that time, I was just starting out and he just said, oh, please don't don't uh, imagine him being a big musician because his, like, his abilities are actually decent. Uh, but, um, how, how should I say? mediocre <laughs> and at this moment at this moment we knew i will work more <laughs> <laughs> but i read and, i read somewhere that you had an unusual amount of colds as a as a child and that your parents thought that playing the flute would actually help your chest is that true yeah that that's <laughs> a funny illusion i i'm, I'm convinced to ski or something like sport wise would uh, tennis something li- like this would develop my lungs uh, much better but it's a of course it's a delusion that it develops lungs and it has an impact for example i breathe normally like uh, every you know with with this diaphragmal breathing this is my normal state i just it's my da- daily routine every every time i breathe in i i use my tummy but every every flute player knows that <laughs> this is what changes actually <laughs> different shoulders that's it <laughs> oh yeah the f- physiology of a flute player is so complex isn't it let's put let's park the piccolo to one side for a moment you began life as a flute player how quickly did you develop because in russia when you were growing up there are so many wonderful musicians and i would imagine it's very hard to make yourself heard amongst this beautiful music and talent I, I remember recently I've been there a couple of months ago and I saw my archive with books from many, many, many competitions, you know, many competitions, thousands of competitions. And the smallest, of course, is uh, just a regional competition. It's really small. But this, those booklets, they, they are sometimes, they are enorm, enormously big. And of course, I had, we had the international competitions and Actually, I'm thankful that I never won a big prize. You know, I always got second prize or no prize, even better. And I'm really thankful for that. It it kept me my pace, so to say, <laughs> practicing and being and being on the 
wave, so to say, that waiting, where is my price or something like this. No, it's just, it kept me fresh that, okay, next time you're going to do a little bit more and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. That's how it worked. But yeah, competitions, since I was, I think, nine years old, my Gosh. first competition. Gosh. Yeah. And were you very self-aware that you were working on your own development or were you constantly comparing yourself from the age of nine to others that you saw in the competition? I actually, a habit never to listen anybody. Wow. Like not, not, never, never, ever. I, w- I would just sit somewhere and just do something else, but not, not to listen any competitors or it just, it was just my habit that I, I thought I wasn't interested. How wonderful. Of course, it, yeah. It's just, it's just so as it is. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just think that's so, <laughs> won- it's so wonderful that you weren't at that time listening to other musicians of your same age and then thinking, oh, they're better than me or they can do things that I can't. You are totally focused in your own performance, your own bubble. Yeah, that's how you can define that. Yeah, it was my my way. It's not even habit. I think it was my way for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so people will know you as a piccolo player, but you're also a stunning flute player. When did you decide to add this little piece of wood into your repertoire? Well, I was an exchange student in Weimar. 2006 to 2007, one year. Uh, basically, I was preparing myself for a competition and there was an audition where I could just try out my program and I won this audition. So I had to go to uh, Germany for one year. So at that time, I even skipped that competition, which I was directed to. But actually, at this moment, I got first lessons with uh, Benjamin Plack. It's my flute, uh, my piccolo teacher. I studied by Wallihase the uh, entire year. And Benjamin Plack, he offered me piccolo lessons. And in, I think I had only half a year with him. But at that moment, I already knew when I'll come back, I will do everything I can to get solo piccolo position because I was totally in love how it works with me. I immediately somehow clicked with the instrument. And that was 2007. I knew already that I will be a piccolo player, solo piccolo player. That's how I started. And it's not that I switched to piccolo. I, yeah, I decided that flute was something on the way to this, <laughs> so to say. And d- does it amuse you to hear of flute players like myself that are scared of it, that struggle with it? Does it amuse you that why are you so worried about playing it? Why don't you play the piccolo like you play the flute? Why do you change your embouchure? Why do you do, why are the shoulders up? Why do you do things differently? Does it, do you find that strange? No, I think piccolo is something really close to hate, lo- love, hate, love, or how you call it. <laughs> That you you uh, it's hard to it's hard to say that it's hard to love such a thing actually because it demands dedication. I think I I dedicated myself to to piccolo and I practiced it last years of my studying actually overbalanced so not 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 equally to flute. I was basically playing more piccolo because I I liked it and I just enjoyed the snappiness and speed and it's really personal preference so to say there's a lot of work for little audible action in an orchestra but when you hear the piccolo play properly in an orchestra my word it makes a difference Mm -hmm. so what do you consider to be the most challenging aspect of playing the piccolo and how do you overcome those challenges so i'm talking to someone like you that is constantly learning and evolving as a piccolo player indeed but what is the most challenging for anybody that is playing the piccolo at the moment? Of course, intonation, of course. Because you, I find myself constantly adjusting this never-ending search of balance when you decide where you lead a little bit more or when you blend yourself into the sound of other instrument. I think this is where, where the, this it, it shows that the movement and never ever settling is the way actually for the 
or that we call it, that you, I, of course, I consider myself learning and I would, I hope I will do it um, until I uh, will go to a rent. <laughs> but I hope, yeah, I think this is only interest for me that it's it's never universal, never something settled that you always adjust and flow and find find ways to adjust to other players yeah for, for me when the piccolo comes in you're so isolated because you're so high up on the orchestral score and say in Marla one when you're playing with the oboe that is a it's a, a quite a big difference in octaves and being able to get the pitch right how quickly is your ear adjusting to the sound that you're hearing Yes, I think indeed, yes, intonation is a reaction. It's basically equals reaction. It depends really. Sometimes I, I try to fit the color first and I, I know what, how, of course, you try and in rehearsals it's different, different. Sometimes it's way out of tune, but finding the right color is vital to, to the intonational process like but i think it it's really it's really fast i think it should be really fast and i do my my, my best immediately to react and to to go and just stay in the moment not to squeeze myself and oh my gosh this is this is what i i avoid to do doing at this moment at every every moment of time to be ready to change because even if somebody started Pitch still can evolve and, and change it, and there still <laughs> you will need to react. It's not that it's clicked one, uh, once and uh, that's it. But the reaction time is really fast. It's always amazed me if you're playing with a flute player or you're playing with an oboe or clarinet player, who moves? <laughs> so if you're that's slightly out, who moves? Because if you move to get, say, slightly lower and they move to get slightly higher, you end up with this constant differential oh. don't you <laughs> yeah where's the obligation sometimes, you know sometimes it sometimes we agree on something that could you for example move with me a little and then it works if not then i move but usually of course i adjust because for me on the side where actually i can i just can do it as fast as i can and then if it if it works for me then we just leave it like this and if if it doesn't work for me and then of course i will ask would you please uh, help me? Because sometimes it's really out of the out of the tone quality, and or that I I would not feel my feel that it works. But it, this is a rare case. Basically, I try myself to react. <laughs> it's, it's, this is pickle away. <laughs> oh, it is. Now I've got some questions, obviously, that have been sent in by our listeners when they knew that you were coming on. One question that really interests me was. How do you balance technical proficiency with emotional expression in your playing? And what techniques do you use to convey different methods or moods and emotions through your music? Now, that is for us people that are scared of piccolo playing. And by the way, I'm, I'm learning to become not scared anymore. When you're looking at emotional expression and technical proficiency i think if you're a good flute player you can i would have thought transfer that over to your piccolo playing but the issues that you've already brought up with is to do with the pitch but also emotional expression how do you balance both in such a small piece of wood i think they're tied together they are one part of another uh, that uh, i always find very inspiring difference between tones and showing that that difference for example in six Shostakovich, just last tones of this piccolo solo they're so different the tones and i find them especially the last tone of course because the chord is changing yes. yeah i i think passages is of course is pretty straightforward it just works and it's impressive and or, or not but for me air and the, the, its direction and how it does colors the tone and how then tones are interacting with each other if they are coming together or should i show this difference this is the balance between my expression and technical skill 
this is where where they're tied together. I think if if I if I understood the question right mm. way, right? This is this is what brings them actually together. That for me they are tied. That I'm I'm not thinking anymore in the way that I should open up or I should close. That no, why I do this this way? I think this way. That asking question, how what 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 would, what would I support? What should I do? And then the tools arrive and. This this is how I how I how I do it last years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're playing an alto flute or a C flute, you obviously have much longer instruments, and you have you almost have more more to feel to find these tonal colours and emotional attachments with the tube you're playing. But with the piccolo being so small, and most of the time, well, it's in Lily always would. How long does it take you to find where those emotional colours are? And is it always in the same place? In other words, if you're wanting something that's open or free or something that's rich and warm, do you know straight away where to find that? Pretty much, yes. When I hear, when I hear, I know my instrument pretty well. And if I hear already, if I know the music and if I, let's, let's put it this way. If I prepare myself to something that I don't know, I, of course, try technically just to see how the things are working. I usually follow the landscape, I, I call it like this. Yes. I don't try to squeeze the higher tones. I accept them that they're high. And technically, I just follow the landscape. And when I know the piece and I try in the in the rehearsals, when, I, when I'm getting to know the piece and I try something in the rehearsals, of course, it takes courage not to be, not to just do play what, what is written, but just try something and put, put the idea and if it works, it works. If not, then you'll try something else. But uh, usually when I know the music, I know how it sounds. I know how my piccolo will react. And I can already pre-listen it in imagination. And then technical tools from last question arrive. And then I just do it, the contrasts, or I let my piccolo, so to say, react to what should be done. And I, I react to, to, the, to the instrument. I rarely do something that just to play through. I'm now convinced that curiosity is the way, that always being curious is the way. And it's the way out of stress, out of the ten- tension on the concert, curiosity. And maybe maybe for some, it's like, it's not a, uh, you know, this feeling of um, being in casino. I don't know how, it, how it's called, like risk. Maybe some some like, some like straightforward risk. I'm not a risky one. I like cu- being curious. The thing I, I try things constantly out out of curiosity. <laughs> and I suppose that stops you from becoming bored with a piece of music that you've played so many, many times, is that every time you play it, you're curious to see what evolves. Exactly this. I constantly do find something that sparkles me to do it once again and once again and then hundred of times again. <laughs> <laughs> so Igor, how has your approach to piccolo playing evolved over the course of your career to date? And sort of what techniques or strategies have you found the most effective in refining your skills? You have this great way of refining your presentations on Instagram within 60 seconds for, for flute and piccolo players. But for yourself, how have you evolved personally with the instrument? Well... My approach changed a lot, of course. It changed from to more, more internally that I, I was thinking that everything I do prepare is the only thing which matters. And I mean, by, by this, I mean that air preparation and my ambushore, I thought that there is still something universal which I can always rely on. but. Through through couple of years of trying things out, I came to to saw that those are, are colors. For example, purely technical. If somebody says that you should put the lips down always, for me it's just a color because everything it it does changes sound. If you put the corner of the lips down and kind of you stretch your embouchure, it does change the sound. And to my ear, I hear that. 
and I hear that everything sounds like this. Bad smiley, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> and opposite way, if everything goes up, it does change the sound. It makes it really, it's not blank, it's a bit more windy. It does has its own corner in the room of colors. And probably best thing is to have a blank canvas and to try them out. And by this, I, I suggest to, to students, for example, just to let everything go completely, relax cheeks. And even it, it does look un, un, unhealthy for a number sure. But when you trust your, yourself, when you trust your instrument and number sure and your teacher and me, <laughs> student just starts to play without any embouchure com on completely relaxed lips. Sound is still there. It's not bad. It's really not bad. Everything is relaxed. And this is a first step to control, to let go. This, I think this is a starting point, which I found the most welcoming. Because <laughs> it's really easy to do. It's, it's easy to try out. And then I think step by step, I evolved. I, I found myself just this technique with whistle tones and whistling that I thought that it's just a resonation of an, of an air, basically, here when, when I whistle. When everybody is whistling, it's just a resonation of air, right speed, and right position of lips. And then whistle tones, it's whistling on the flute. It's just the same principle, like whistling, but using flute. And by this, I found for myself, and that's why I shared it, uh, and I was curious if it really works, if I, if I imagine it myself or if it really works. So whistling helps to find this speed of air and pro a proper ap approximate position for the tongue and the lips. And whistle tones, they give the direction. And this is the starting point for the tone. It's, this is where it just resonates on the flute. When, when, when air is not too fast, when it's not too slow, it doesn't crackles down, cracks, doesn't cracks down, it just sounds properly as, as it is intended for the tone. This, I find this a good starting point. And then you can make it lighter or darker, more hollow, more windy, whatever you like. This is how I evolved uh, my understanding of the sound, sound making. I love that because when you look at flute players that pick up the piccolo for the first time, they immediately go tight and the cheek muscles go really taut. <laughs> The embouchure hole goes really, really small and the little tiny, yeah, exactly that. And I love the fact that you just say, put the piccolo there and just blow. Just blow with your, your, your lips down and just blow. Don't care what sort of sound you make. But as you say, the sound will come out and it will be quite a big sound, won't it? Yeah, it did this. Relaxed there. Ah, for piccolo player. That is the ultimate holy grail, isn't it? Playing the piccolo without forcing the S tree. <laughs> so taking that on board, what advice do you have for aspiring piccolo players? And what qualities do you believe are necessary for success as a piccoloist or piccolo player, whatever you'd like to be called? I think being always in the moment, always being in the reaction mode is the way for me. I think it's how I find myself comfortable playing piccolo. Of course, I Imagine what I'm going to play, but reaction is just one word. And being ready, never settle, never look for something universal. Uh, look for your own way, know your instrument, and find out those tones, for example, that are out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> because on every piccolo, they are slightly different. And always looking, being curious about the instrument, how it reacts. This would be my suggestion. And probably those are actually qualities of piccolo players that nobody would do it if, if you would not like it. I think it's for solo piccolo quite obvious to love this. But for, for those who play piccolo as a side project <laughs> or sometimes, I would say that maybe whistle tones is also short, shortest description. It's really helpful and what we took on board from the last question, being relaxed, is also the way. And just 
and not try to control every muscle on the face and look for a whistle tone, it will definitely help just to play the tone. Because if a person is not a solo piccolo player, it's and it struggles a little bit even, it, it might help. So what I'm, yeah, what I'm hearing from you is to stay very much in the moment because as a piccolo player, you are not only a soloist, but you're also adding embellishment to the orchestral passage that's been written. So you need to stay in the moment to be able to gel and work with the other orchestral members. But most importantly of all is to get to know this instrument, get to know this piece of wood, find out where the colours are. Find out where your weaknesses are. And you can only do that if you're in the moment, can't you? Because then you are listening. Yes, exactly. I'm going to ask you a very mundane question. This one came in from a very young flute player, which was, and I'm sure you've been asked it so many, many times. What do you enjoy most about playing with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra? Of course, once you hear it, you'll know the answer. Perfect. Say no more. That says it all. Whenever any, you've ever sat inside an orchestra, that feeling when it begins and when you're performing says it all. One question is the challenge of performing in different concert halls that have different acoustic qualities. How do you have to change your approach or the orchestra changes their approach according to the venue? Is that down to the conductor or is it down to you as individuals on his interpretation? Of course, conductor decides what he wants. I usually follow. I try to react what what is being said. If more, then more. If usually less, then I do less. <laughs> but if you're in a different concert hall and there's more to the bounce, it's not a dead feel, which is the harder to play in for you as a musician where there's not necessarily anything coming back to you because it's all going forward? I think I can, by now, I can say approximately even, I can imagine how the hall will react. Even by walking in, I already hear the acoustics. I see the surfaces, I see the construction, how it's designed. And I can already imagine myself what, what was the purpose of the hall and how can I work with it. Yeah, there are so many different halls and they react, of course, differently. differently. But usually... It's really up to conductor because he is in the sweet spot. He is in the point where he can actually decide if there is a reflector above me or or not. And for me, it sounds loud, but you can't hear something in the hall. Of course, there is always even a third person who can say uh, their comment from the hall. This is how it works, I think. As soon as you walk in, you roughly now know how you're going to play. Yes, yes. And you're of still and you're that. still so young. <laughs> 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 oh, so I, I actually I, so many holes already through this third ten, 10 years, but a little bit more because I was in academy and testing uh, trial time. So we, we traveled a lot and I saw many, many different holes. And finally, what do you believe from your position as an orchestral member is the role of classical music in today's ever changing society? And how do we engage more younger people? Well, uh, we have some education programs. We have, in, in, in our orchestra, we have uh, even an, an, an entire department, educational department, and we sometimes work with very small kids, like kindergarten kids. And I went to kindergarten and showed uh, block flutes and uh, small flutes and my own flute to hundreds of, of small kids. And then we, we have different projects with teenagers and uh, open rehearsals for schools. And they come to listen. And of course, we are used to the sound of orchestra. We're used to this, this academic and music. And for them, sometimes quite big. <laughs> and uh, it's not so usual for young people nowadays to hear an orchestra. And when they come, they're hooked. <laughs> we know we know basically that puts a seed in the person because this sound of the orchestra it really is something mesmerizing and of course through social media it's very important nowadays to be there and not to be perfectionist about your uh, being there that it's just the way it is nobody is perfect and just starting something and doing something for as as a, as a as a musician it's important. And this is actually how we get 
I think to young musicians also through this social media. If you guys listen to this podcast, then you have to promise me, of all people, to do one thing, it which is to go and visit Igor's Instagram page. Because if you're scared of playing the piccolo, he debunks everything. He actually makes the piccolo sound like a real instrument. And if he, yeah, and I'm saying that because I'm 60. I've, I've been scared of it all my life and I've had to play it so many times. But when Igor puts a piccolo short up or reel up, there's something on there that just tr is transformational. And it's only a small thing, but it transforms the way that you think about it because the sound opens up. And as soon as the sound opens up on the piccolo and you're nice and relaxed and you can hear something, the eyes spark. And then when the eyes spark, you start to get enjoyment. And that is all this man wants to do, is to make you fall in love with the piccolo. And I think he's doing a wonderful, wonderful job in just making it very approachable. So, Igor, please tell everybody your Instagram page, please. Yes, you can find me at Igor Kin, E-G-O-R-K-I-N, dot piccolo, with P-I-C-C-O-L-O -C -C in Instagram. And I'm there constantly, daily, answering questions, commenting. And they thank are, you, Jean -Paul. No, they are so wonderful. And just thank you for, I know your time is really, really precious. You have such a busy schedule and you're taking a break at the moment from social media to do all your work because orchestral musicians don't just go in and do a concert and then go to the pub afterwards. They have to do a lot of mental preparation, a lot of reading the scores they have to take away all the comments that have been said by the conductor and they have to process that. So thank you so much for taking some time out on this Saturday to, to speak to me and to my L listeners. You are a wonderful man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your invitation. I'm, I hope to meet once again, once in person. I wish you and your listeners a wonderful day and enjoy playing piccolo and flute and listening to it. I'm sure we will meet soon, Igor. I'm sure we will. And to you, everybody, thank you very much for joining us this week on Talking Flutes Extra. May your week ahead be musically fulfilling. And may your top C on the piccolo resonate beautifully and be in tune, because mine never is. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>